Good morning, bonjour. I'm Art Eggleton. Uh, pleased to welcome you all to Open Caucus. I'm a senator from Toronto, and beside me is uh, Senator uh, uh, Raymond St. Germain from Quebec, who yes, is co-chairing the meeting with me today. I want to first of all congratulate Raymond on becoming uh, the deputy facilitator and also the facilitator, Pao Wu, uh, who's here. Congratulations to both of you. Um, the Open Caucus was first established back in 2014 when Senate Liberals opened their caucus doors to the public on Wednesday mornings. Uh, today, for the first time, uh, the Independent Senators Group and the Independent Senate Liberals are beginning a pilot project of co-sponsoring discussion on issues of national importance. This nonpartisan collaboration brings together two groups, two independent groups, which actually represent the majority of the members of the Senate as it now uh, stands. Uh, into our subject for today, we have seen dramatic changes in the area of international law and indigenous human rights. But older and existing agreements are, are yet to accommodate these changes. For example, indigenous peoples were not given the opportunity to have a, a voice in the making of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, unlike other international instruments and conventions. The unclosed system needs a serious update to reflect the development of international law and standards that respect, recognize, and protect indigenous peoples' rights. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which uh, was ratified uh, fully by Canada in 2012, specifically recognizes Indigenous peoples' rights to their lands, territories, and resources. Yet we have consistently failed to properly and fully engage the Inuit people in much of this lawmaking. To address this important topic, we have four outstanding panelists, one by video conference and three of them here in the room, uh, who will speak uh, uh, to move how we could move forward with government Inuit relations in the Canadian Arctic. Now, just a couple of logistics uh, points. Coffee and tea is available at the back of the room. Uh, and uh, also, there's some interesting maps uh, in the adjacent uh, uh, room that uh, perhaps one, uh, perhaps uh, Senator Watt will explain a little later. But these help to uh, uh, understand better the importance of uh, the, the land and territory and the and the sea to the Inuit people. Now, uh, secondly, uh, translation and I say this for the people in the audience I'm facing, uh, is on channel 13 for English and channel 14 uh, for French. Now, talking about audience, uh, we encourage, as always, uh, audience participation. Uh, if you want to ask a question of the panelists or if you want to make a statement, uh, the microphone is there to do it. You'll have up to three minutes. Uh, and uh, all you need to do is signal to Agnes. Agnes, put your pan hand up. She's right over there. And so I can get your name down, and if you happen to represent an organization, get to know what that is as well. And then interspersed with the questions and comments by the senators, uh, we will work in that audience uh, participation. So now I'd like to uh, welcome uh, my co-chair, uh, Senator Raymond Saint-Germain, uh, for a few words en français. Merci, Monsieur le co-président. Thank you, co-chair. It's an honor and a privilege for me to be here and to share the chair with you this morning. I would like to welcome all our colleagues here present our honorable colleagues, I'm impressed by how many of you are here knowing that uh, we have this subcommittee here before we're into chambers. So thank you for joining us. Much appreciated. And thank you for those who have joined us in the general audience. And congratulations, Honorable Senator Eagleton, for the vision that uh, you have um, brought forward here and that the members of your caucus have joined in with to discuss and reflect deeply on these issues of great importance to Canadians 
issues that we need to move out ahead on. Very often, Parliament and legislation lags behind and falls in with the general evolution of society. But in this type of issue, it's very clear to see that not only do we have to catch up, but we should set out boldly ahead. I'm very happy to see that we have a senator of the caucus, a conservative caucus, Honorable Senator Charlie. What? No, liberal. I'm very sorry. Please allow me to correct myself. Because this shows clearly that we have within our various groups within the Senate many experts. We certainly hope that uh, Honorable Senators, members of the Conservative Caucus, will also choose to join us because we would like to draw on the expertise throughout the chamber. The issue today then is a very uh, current one, a very real one of great importance, and we can not carry out our role correctly without the contribution of both our colleagues and independent experts. Independent experts whose work has been recognized by their peers. Thus, it is with great pleasure that we honor the presence of Ms. Aporta, Mr. Giro, and Mr. Tutu, of course, the Honorable Hunter Tutu, Member of Parliament for Nunavut. I um, will leave the floor to you. I think that uh, the housekeeping issues have already been covered in English and surely understood by all, and it's with great pleasure that I will hear your presentations. We do invite conservative uh, yes. uh, senators and MPs. We, we invite all uh, senators, all MPs to come, and occasionally we have had uh, both types, senators of other parties and uh, groups and MPs come to it. Well, let's get underway. Uh, four panelists we're going to hear from now. Our basic guideline is about seven minutes per panelist, but uh, I've never cut anybody off yet. So uh, from there, let's go to our first panelist. And our first panelist is one of our own. Uh, we don't often have uh, members of uh, the Senate start off or, or part of panel, but this is particularly appropriate because uh, uh, Senator Charlie Watt uh, has worked on this issue uh, all of his time in the Senate. And he's been in the Senate for 33 years. Uh, uh, he was appointed by Prime Minister Trudeau, the first Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, he, he's had a varied career background, including experience in both the public and private sectors. His private career includes service as a Northern Officer with the Department of Indian Northern Affairs. He's a founding president of North Quebec Inuit Association, the founding president of the Makovic Corporation, for which he has also served as treasurer and president of Air Inuit Limited. His public career includes serving as co-chair of the Inuit Committee on National Issues, member of the Nunavik uh, Constitutional Committee, uh, and as a board member of the Inuit uh, Tapir Sat uh, of Canada. Sorry if I mispronounce some of these. Uh, Senator Watt has also served on the board of the Circumpolar Chamber of Commerce as one of its uh, first directors. So. Lead us off, Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Chairman, Madam, colleagues. Uh, first, I would like to uh, to say good morning to all. It's a little too early for me to uh, maybe while I'm making the presentations, and it'll gradually wake me up. And uh, let's get on the road. Uh, what I would like to uh, to indicate. To, uh, to the audience is the fact that I have been privileged to be here in the Senate. And on top of that, and I also have a great deal of support and help from my colleagues, which I do appreciate greatly in terms of uh, dealing with a certain subject matter and the way that we have to stick handle the matters to elevate it and to try to take it to the a proper sector. Uh, colleagues, uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, to indicate to you so you would be able to follow clearly what we are dealing with here. In my past, starting in October year 2012, that was the first information that I required from the law, from the Peter Hudson's law firm, and it was produced and it was commissioned by me. This is talks about the Inuit Canada a Treaty Partners or Free Agent. And there were the reasons why that we add on concept of a free agent 
knowing the fact where we are in the Arctic and the interest that the international community have in regards to our resources that are under our feet. As an example, we also have a very strong uh, a nation right next door to us in the Arctic, which they happen to be Siberian and Russian people. Uh, when there is a subject dealing with uncertainty, unrest, sometimes you wonder what is going to follow next. I guess that's, this is a big part of my where I'm coming from because we are on the front line, as you all know. Whatever happens in the world is not going to be coming from the south, it's going to be coming from the north. I think we all have to understand that and realize that is a very possibility. This is a, one of the reasons why that makes it very, very important for us as Inuit living in the Arctic to be able to participate and to take part and make decisions because we've been there longer than anybody else and we know it best. And we can only provide assistance to our Canadian government and to our nations, which is a bigger society than we do. Being a smaller society in the country sometimes it doesn't help you on account of the fact your numbers are small. At times the politics is run and overrule by the majority of people which unfortunately that is the case, and always, always will be the remain that way. First, I would like to, uh, to say that the Inuit to the Arctic are significant, at least to my understanding, to Canadian government. We're here, we're not planning to move away from our homeland, and we're planning to stay regardless of what happens. <clears throat> the rights of indigenous, pe in indigenous people are gaining a public rec recognition, but there is a work to be done in the area of a consultation and the participations in the policy making. This is a one area that I do feel that lacks a great deal. I was involved in arriving with the modern treaty back back in 19, uh, well, that's back in 1975. That's 40, a little more than 40 years ago now. And still today, as a commitment that were made by Canadian government and the, uh, and the provinces that we were dealing with, in order to realign the laws on the policy, it still have not took place. As you probably aware that not too long ago, the Prime Minister made the statements publicly designating seven ministers to review the policy on the law of Canada to see whether they correspond with the modern treaty. This is a, a challenge to us in, in regards to uh, the modern treaties. We're having a great deal of implementation problem on that account. The fact that they have not relied the laws and the policy of a government to correspond with the modern treaty that has been signed up to now. I thought this is an important for you to know because I'm going to be leading into uh, an area that that focus more on the international issues, but we also have a great deal of problems still, even though that we sort of have completed our long claims negotiations, which uh, impacted uh, uh, four long claims recent, which is Nunavik was the first one, and then Nunavut, and then NWT, and Nunatsiavut, which is Northern Labrador. Those are the four long frames regions that runs and have responsibility to implement the treaties that were signed, one back in 1975 and the consequence with that afterwards. And the others also followed the suit. My guiding principle at the Inuit must be equal partners in decision making and making the Arctic resource development must be promoting the health of Inuit community and the environment must be protected. In Canada, Inuit have large, largely settled with the ground and we have four land claims region, as I mentioned this, uh, a minute ago, Inuvialuit, Western Arctic, Nunavut, 
my region called Nunavik, Northern Quebec, and, uh, and Nunatsiavut, Labrador. Our challenge, as I mentioned to you, is the implementation that needs to be revisited at some point. If we are having a great deal of difficulties getting a knowledge from the Government of Canada in regards to the Arctic issues to relate to Arctic sovereignty matter, maybe what we need to ask ourselves a question is, what are the commitments that the Government of Canada have made that makes us feel secure? Knowing the fact there is no certainty. Clarity is the issue. Government gets the clarity. Does the Aboriginal groups on, on the other side of the table, do they get clarity? Not that much. So those are the matters that have to be visited at some point. We are taxpayers in every region of the country, unlike the First Nation. We are full-fledged taxpayers, just like you. From our side, there is an expectation that we will be consulted on the issue which impact our economy, <laughs> land, water, and sea ice in our territory. We expect this from Canadian government, but also from other <coughs> nations who are reaching into our territory. In other words, what I'm trying to say here is that I think the government of Canada do owe it to us and make it absolutely clear exactly where, where our space is within the, within the society of the way they are dealing with the international communities and using UNCLOS, the Law of the Sea Convention, which we are still not part of it. As Inuit, we have always lived on the ice, and the ice is our winter highway across the tundra and from one shore to the other. We have historic links across the Arctic, from Greenland to Nunatsiavut, northern Labrador, and the northern parts of Canada, and Alaska, and even across the David Streets to Russia and uh, Scandinavian country. We continue to keep those relations through organizations like Inuit Sukumpolo Council, and the Arctic Council, and many agencies of the UN. This is a significant area of mining. There is a significant area of mining and resource extraction, economic development, shipping, and use of Northwest Passage. As the temperature in the Arctic continues to get warmer, we are seeing more people sailing in the Arctic water, and this is a concern for the Inuit, for their safety, which is a big part because the water is warming up to a certain extent, but there is still always going to be the ice, the formulated every year. That is still not going to go away. And we are the first responders. <coughs> Hold on for a minute here. As the temperature in the Arctic continues to get warmer, we are seeing more people sailing in the Arctic water, and this is a concern for the Inuit. We have the Northwest Passage for millions here, and we are the first responders during the crisis in the region, yet we still don't have the necessary funding to ensure safe passage of the SEP who are using our gateway. I think this is an important. On the international level, I am also concerned about Canada participation on the United Nations and their representation in the Canadian delegations. As you know, in the past, under the Conservative government, Conservative government were not too keen on signing up or recognizing or even for us understanding it that we had that problem. And I do believe, even under the new government, we're still having a problem of getting the signal out and be understood and be asked to participate. That is still not happening today, unfortunately. 
Also, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People was created. We still have to address structural deficiency in their organizations, and we still don't have a mechanism for meaningful a dialogue at the United Nations on the international work which impact our people. I think this is not only apply to the UN, but it's also applied to our Canadian government here in Canada. So we still don't have. We, we are good talking about government to government, nation to nation, but where is the structure that would make it reality, dialogue between ourselves and the government of Canada? I'm a negotiator in my life. I have dealt with the modern treaties through the negotiations. I have not seen people talking uh, in the light of what needs to be done, but still coming short in terms of laying out what the structure, what the structure should be. When I came into the Senate a long time ago now, I would say 17 years ago, I was the chair of this committee, and I came out with a report called Forging Relation. And that report is still collecting the dust on the shelf and have not been looked at. Here we are. We are still struggling with our government to line ourselves up to be able to have an intelligent dialogue, and that still not happened. Daily, we'll talk about our, our um, uh, a colleague from Alaska, Daily Sambo, is going to be talking about this in more detail. But the United, uh, under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the Limits of the Continental Shelf, is an example where indigenous voice are not heard under the UN. And I would say the same, not also under the Canadian. Canada had offered limited participation to the Inuit on this file, but we should be central to the process. I think this is important. Other organization of concern is Arctic Council. This is make up of eight Arctic states with a rotating chairmanship, and also indigenous people have permanent membership through six indigenous organizations we have permanent status, which is consolidative. And that's all it is. In my opinion, Inuit should have a leadership role at the Arctic Council, and we should be the host of that organization. I think this is a very important, and we should drive that home. And we need your help to make that happen. Unless you're willing to go to another state of uncertainty been uh, directed by people who have no knowledge of the Arctic at all whatsoever. I think it's a time now to start looking at it. You need people that know, know and understand the nature of what we're dealing with. <clears throat> there are some areas which are important to the Inuit. And I'm going to be turning this uh, over to talk to Aporda, which has been very helpful and innovative in terms of traditional trail of Inuit and through demonstrate Inuit historic use and occupancy and on the territory. So I will turn that over to uh, Senator, uh, Dr. Uh, Aporda. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Watt. Uh, uh, Senator St. Germain will introduce Dr. Aporda. I just want to, for uh, colleagues at the table, uh, once the, the panel has complete, uh, then uh, questions and comments uh, from you, uh, and we'd be happy to get your names down if you just want to signal either uh, Raymond or myself, and we'll put your name down on the uh, list. And our next panelist. Merci, Senator Watt, et j'anticipe. Thank you, Honorable Senator Watt, and I certainly expect to hear many questions. Given that your presentation was of the highest interest, welcome, Dr. Claudio Aparda, Associate Professor at Dalhousie University, uh, where you direct 
the Marine Affairs Programme. Mr. Aporta has done ethnographic research in the Canadian Arctic since 1998. He has documented Inuit knowledge and use of marine and coastal areas across the Canadian Arctic. His research has also focused on the geographic representation of Indigenous environmental knowledge. He is also a faculty member of the Geomatics and Cartographic Research Centre at Carleton University and is the current director of Dalhousie University's ESRI GIS Centre of Excellence for Higher Education. So without further ado, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. To be here, uh, thank you, Senator Watt, for um, supporting uh, this important work. I'm here to present um, evidence of Inuit use of uh, marine and coastal spaces. This is just one way in which this evidence can be presented, but it, it relates to my work, um, working on um, Inuit mobility and uh, basically um, uh, documenting uh, Inuit trails, traditional trails and routes. Uh, in uh, 14 communities across the Arctic through participatory mapping sessions and, and in some cases through a GPS, GPS following hunters on their, on their travels. Um, the data that you're going to see was collected between 2000 and 2017 with, with some additional data from, from other sources. Um, what I would like you to do is to maybe try to forget um, classic uh, cartographic representations of the Canadian Arctic uh, portraying uh, communities as isolated from each other and the Arctic Ocean as a place of, uh, of transit. Um, um, but I also want you to remember that these marine spaces are extremely important today uh, due to climate change, um, uh, the opening of waters and uh, projections of, um, of increasing marine traffic in, in these areas. Um, the sea ice, uh, in particular, has always been seen, even today, as an obstacle for navigation. The fact that people are talking again about the Northwest Passage is connected to the fact that the sea ice is diminishing. Uh, for Inuit, um, this is uh, a completely different um, uh, uh, vision of, uh, of marine areas that are basically associated to the land. So we have the sea ice uh, attaching to the land. And, and basically uh, extending the territory uh, with a continuum between the land and, and the ocean uh, in a very complex ways. Um, I talk about Inuit trails, but they refer to um, uh, trails on the snow and trails on the sea ice and also of open water routes. Um, these might disappear after a snow storm or after the sea ice uh, breaks. Uh, but they are permanent in, uh, in people's, uh, in the memories of, of, of peoples and communities in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, some of these trails can be uh, tracked down uh, hundreds of years through, through um, historical mapping, but uh, there is also archaeological evidence that some of these trails might be hundreds and even thousands of years old. So they are really permanent uh, features of, uh, of um, Arctic use. Uh, what I will do now is to, to, to give you a really quick tour of, um, of some of the data that has been collected over all these years. Um, I will rush through um, the slides. I could spend half an hour on each of the maps that you will see. But basically, what, um, uh, so, so you have a sense, a geographic sense of what I will present, I will uh, go uh, pretty much um, more or less from east uh, to, to west. And the maps I will show you are roughly on the, uh, on the numbers that you see on the, on the map on the screen. So I will start with Maine uh, in the Nunatsiavut region in Labrador. Uh, what you can see there is um, uh, that the, the traditional trails that people have been using are following frozen water bodies, um, including um, you know, fields and bays, uh, but also rivers and creeks and lakes. And you can also see how the trails reach eventually onto the ocean, in that case, uh, where the, more or less where the flowage is, uh, where people go for purposes of uh, mostly hunting and fishing. Now, the trails of Nain um, are also connected to the trails of other communities. So in this case, of the communities of the Nunavik side. And this is something that happens um, over and over again. So the trails of one community will overlap with the trails of the next. Um, regardless of, um, of provincial or territorial boundaries and even of uh, land claim boundaries. 
um, there is a sense of connection that eventually goes from Greenland to Alaska. Uh, what you see here is um, uh, a map of the Hudson Strait area with trails uh, documented in Saluit in northern Quebec and also in Cape Dorset and Coral Harbor in the Nunavut side. Uh, what you can see again is the intense use of this very important uh, marine space that is um, uh, you know, the way to Churchill, basically. So very important uh, from, for, for, for ships, but also very important for Inuit that would use, um, that would go by either snowmobile, or in this case by boat, uh, and um, hand marine mammals. Um, the trails that, um, all the trails that you, you will see in my presentation, they all start and finish in the communities. As you can see in those trails that I map with a GPS unit. In fact, they start and end in people's door houses. And, um, and that is um, really important in terms of understanding the Arctic as interconnected, not as you know, separated little units where people are, are, are not connected with each other outside of um, um, you know, flying. Um, no, there is a, a really important sense of connection. Uh, what you see here are place names. Uh, those dots are place names that are uh, related deeply with uh, pe the places that people use and with the trails in what I call um, Inuit oral geography. So people tradition Inuit did traditionally didn't use maps they use uh, narratives to explain where things were. And one of those narratives and one of those devices uh, were and are the place names. In Iglulik, uh, what you can see here, um, in those lines in red are actually sea ice uh, features that were documented by Inuit um, uh, in Iglulik a few years ago. And what you can see is that the trails are also connected to these features on the sea ice. So Inuit recognize the topography on the sea ice that recurs every year, uh, roughly on the same locations and always following the same, um, the same dynamic. Um, this is also a very important area, marine area for Canada, the Lancaster Sound, the entrance to the Northwest Passage. And, uh, and again, you can see how um, the trails uh, basically go across Lancaster Sound. In this case, we're talking about sled trails. Um, what I want to focus on that particular crossing, which is 149 kilometers long. It was mapped um, by elders in the community of Arctic Bay. And I don't know if you can see those little circles there, but those are basically sleeps. Uh, so p people that um, are traveling with snow, do um, uh, with um, uh, dog sleds, would actually have to, to overnight twice, which means that there is actually a history on the, on the sea, and something that is um, uh, no, not very uh, uh, commonly understood by, by non-Inuit, this historical systematic use of marine spaces. Uh, you can also see here in this uh, map um, uh, from north to south uh, that the trails uh, would actually follow uh, the topography of the land, and, uh, and again, uh, moving on to, to the marine areas. The place names that I have decided to identify there are basically on the land, but they are all connected to marine-related um, phenomena, uh, from oceanographic phenomena, um, uh, you know, basically describing how the ice would come, to um, um, uh, marine biology, uh, you know, the basically behavior of marine mammals, where they can be found, etc. So the, the Inuit knowledge of, of the Arctic and of all these areas is not, you know, just kind of a holistic understanding. It's also a very technical and precise knowledge. Um, this is also a very significant um, part uh, of, the, uh, um, of the Northwest Passage um, uh, very important for Canada, you know, the, the, the area where this, uh, the search for the Franklin expedition took place and, and, and so on. Um, I would like you also to look at um, uh, how populated that area is by trails and by place names. And um, I would like you to look at this particular place name, um, uh, Nagiyuktut, which uh, basically uh, relates to caribou herds that cross the sea ice every year, back and forth, the caribou migration. So um, people in that area, in, in Kukluktuk, are particularly worried about the effects of not only climate change, but also ice breaking, for instance. Not necessarily only on the marine mammals, but on the caribou herd. Again, something that we wouldn't think of um, uh, as non-Inuit. 
Um, so the trails eventually connect, of course, to the buffer C. Um, we are hoping that the next stage of the, of the project would actually document the Inuvialu territory, which is uh, roughly almost one million square kilometers, um, so the size of the province of Ontario. And um, uh, eventually, oh, the map didn't show, but ev you, you could see the map, the Panarctic map, um, basically on the, on the stands, on the exhibits. And the idea, again, is to show uh, how uh, interconnected the communities are, um, creating a new type of visualization of, uh, of what the Arctic really is. So um, I would like to, again, emphasize how important um, the, 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 Inuit the understanding of Inuit mobility is to, under to, to, to basically get a sense of um, the systematic use of these spaces and uh, basically understanding the land and ocean as a continuum. So I would like to thank again uh, Senator Watt for all his help and the Liberal Caucus too. And I will be happy to answer questions afterwards. Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Porta. Our, our next speaker comes to us uh, on video, and that is uh, Dr. Uh, Dali Sambo Doro. Uh, and uh, by way of introduction, she has uh, played an active role in the formation uh, of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and previously served as chair of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. She specializes in public international law, international human rights law, international relations, and Alaska Native self-determination. In addition, she has experience in the administration, management, and coordination of statewide, national, and international organizations. Currently, Dr. Doro serves as an associate professor of political science at the University of Alaska in Anchorage, Alaska member of the Inuit Circumpolar uh, Council Advisory Committee on UN Issues, and a member of the International Law Association Committee on Implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Welcome, Dr. Doro. The, the floor is yours, and if uh, everyone could uh, observe the screens, please. If you can hear me in the room, and in particular the technicians, I'm having difficulty hearing you. Uh, did you hear my introduction just now? We get the... If you can hear me, maybe I would then proceed until the technicians can sort out. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right. I apologize that I couldn't be uh, present in person, but thank you for the opportunity to share some remarks to this open caucus gathering about the progressive development of international law and the increasing need for Inuit across the Canadian Arctic to become more directly involved in the matters that affect their rights, lives, and communities. Today, I want to briefly focus upon the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Inuit representatives prioritized this work through the Inuit Circumpolar Council and participated directly, actively, and consistently in the important human rights standard setting exercise to achieve the UN Declaration. After 25 years of dialogue and negotiation between Indigenous peoples and member states, including the Government of Canada, on September 13, 2007, the General Assembly adopted the UN Declaration. The vote of the General Assembly was 140 feet, 144 countries in favor, four against, and 11 abstentions. The four opposing states, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States, have all since reversed their positions. And consensus on the UN Declaration was achieved when the last state, the United States, reversed its objection in December 2010 in favor of support. Canada declared in its November 2010 endorsement, we are now confident that Canada can interpret the principles expressed in the Declaration in a manner that is consistent with our Constitution and legal framework. 
The UN Declaration affirms the comprehensive human rights norms that Inuit and other indigenous peoples have identified as the minimum standards for their survival, dignity, and well-being. The rights affirmed in the UN Declaration are not new rights, but rather rights that have been recognized in domestic law in numerous countries across the globe and in international law. The UN Declaration provides the distinct cultural context of Indigenous peoples, both as individuals and as collectivities, with important economic, social, cultural, spiritual, and political rights. Regarding the UN Declaration's legal status, James Anaya, the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, emphasizes that even though the Declaration itself is not legally binding in the same way that a treaty is, the Declaration reflects legal commitments that are related to the UN Charter, other treaty commitments, and customary international law. Consistent with the interpretation of the International Law Association Committee on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the UN Declaration is deserving of utmost respect, and its preamble clearly implies that respect of the UN Declaration represents an essential prerequisite in order for states to comply with some of their obligations provided for by the United Nations Charter. Regional and domestic courts and commissions and the UN treaty bodies are interpreting and relying upon the UN Declaration. The significance of the UN Declaration has been further reinforced by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. 16 of the 94 calls to action are tied to the Declaration. Call to Action 43 calls for federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to fully adopt and implement the UN Declaration as the framework for reconciliation. Human rights are interrelated, interdependent, and indivisible. Therefore, the rights affirmed in the UN Declaration must be read as a whole. However, I want to underscore several specific provisions that are relevant to the topic of direct, active, and meaningful engagement of Inuit in a few important arenas. As a comprehensive international human rights instrument, the UN Declaration affirms that indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination, as well as rights to lands, territories, and resources. For example, Article 25 affirms that indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinctive spiritual relationship with their lands, territories, waters, and coastal seas, and other resources, and to uphold their responsibilities to future generations in this regard. And Article 29 affirms that indigenous peoples have the right to the conservation and protection of the environment and the productive capacity of their lands or territories and resources. Significantly, Article 18 of the UN Declaration affirms that indigenous peoples have the right to participate in decision-making in matters which would affect their rights. In addition, Article 19 affirms that states shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the indigenous peoples concerned in order to obtain their free, prior, and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. When read in context, and specifically in the context of Inuit as a maritime people, and in relation to Inuit rights and interest in the Arctic Ocean and coastal seas. Inuit have a right to participate in decision-making. There is also an obligation on the part of government to directly engage and consult with Inuit on matters that affect them and to gain their free prior and informed consent before taking any actions that may affect them. In conclusion, like the progressive development of international law, which now accommodates the distinct cultural context of indigenous peoples, including Inuit, allows me to 
suggest a few possible concrete actions that could be taken by the government of Canada. First of all, there is a need for the government to actually adopt and implement the UN Declaration in a meaningful and comprehensive fashion and in favor of Inuit and other Indigenous peoples across Canada. I want to share a recent example from the International Whaling Commission. Like other intergovernmental organizations, they have undertaken an effort to integrate the UN Declaration standards into the work of the Aboriginal Subsistence Whaling Subcommittee and the Aboriginal Subsistence Whaling Working Group. Based on this example, another option to safeguard Inuit rights and interests in relation to the Arctic Ocean and coastal seas is to consider ways in which the Government of Canada could lead an effort to integrate the UN Declaration Standards into the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, for example, throughout all of their ongoing and future actions, including their submissions to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. Furthermore, the government could establish a mechanism for ongoing, consistent dialogue between Inuit and the national government specifically concerning the Arctic Ocean, coastal seas, and the marine environment that it depend upon. In this way, Inuit rights and interests would inform the work of various regional organizations such as the Arctic Council. In this regard, I agree with what the Senator uh, expressed in regard to the need for a greater role for Arctic Indigenous peoples in the Arctic Council. Such a mechanism uh, may be helpful in relation to Canada's commitments to other intergovernmental organizations and various international treaties, the commitments that Canada has made in a wide array of political arenas, such as the International Maritime Organization's Polar Code. I recognize that the Inuit Crown Agreement is in place, but potentially these issues could be included or addressed in a distinct fora. Such options, including any proposed mechanism, should be undertaken in a manner fully consistent with the UN Declaration Standards and should include the representative national and regional Inuit organizations and entities. These are just a few examples. I trust that once the UN Declaration and its significance are understood by the Government of Canada, as well as the society as a whole, an essential normative framework that each of you will find additional innovative and creative ways to uphold these important Indigenous human rights standards in favor of Inuit, as well as all other Indigenous peoples of Canada. And I look forward to our discussion and hope we don't have any uh, technical difficulties in uh, the audio-visual uh, portion remaining. Again, Kriyanak. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Doro, for your very clear presentation. Uh, we could hear you here. Can you hear me now or not? I, I can. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I, yeah. I, we'll be going to questions uh, and answers after one more uh, panelist, and uh, please hang in there, and we'd very much like to talk to you further. Okay, thank you. So our last and uh, final speaker is, uh, last but not least, the Honourable Hunter Tutu, who was first elected as the member of the Legislative Assembly for Iqaluit Centre in 1999, representing uh, for 14 years. He was also Speaker of the Legislative Assembly until 2013. Mr. Hunter Tutu has a deep understanding of the challenges facing Nunavut, having held numerous cabinet positions, including Minister Responsible for the Nunavut Housing Corporation. He uh, was uh, in particular in charge of homelessness and also Minister of Education. Hunter was elected as the Member of Parliament for Nunavut in October 2015. He has extensive experience in public administration, 
having held positions such as Recreation Coordinator for the Hamlet of Arviat, Administrative Officer for the Department of Economic Development and Transportation, and Assistant Director of the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation in Iqaluit. So with this background, I'm sure he has much to share with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Madam Co-Chair and uh, Blackout, uh, Beaumontin, good morning uh, and hello, everyone. It is uh, indeed a, a real pleasure for me to be here this morning for this discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank the other presenters, uh, Dr. Sambaldora and Dr. Aporta, for their knowledgeable contributions to the, the discussion this morning. I think it's clear to me and I'm sure it's to you as well that uh, both are experts in their field, so thank you very much for your passion and your work on Arctic and Indigenous issues. And I haven't forgotten my, my good friend here, uh, Charlie, Charlie Watt, Senator Watt. Uh, I want to thank you personally um, for your presentation and for the invitation to participate uh, in this discussion. Uh, Senator Watt and I go back uh, a long ways. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, him and my father were friends um, before I was born. And I think if you look at the maps that were displayed there earlier, the connections between Inuit from different regions, there's a, a living example. Um, and, you know, I know, uh, as I'm sure all of you do, that he has, a, you know, an excellent worth, work ethic and, and a passion, a passion for advocacy on behalf of Inuit and other Indigenous people uh, in this country. So, personally, thank you, Senator Watt. Um, a major part of the, of Canadian identity is rooted in the Canadian Arctic region. A defining characteristic of this region is the people, the people that have called it home for thousands of years. Today I speak to you on behalf of these people and particularly on behalf of the people of Nunavut. Last fall, I said that I would visit every community in Nunavut over the coming year. Uh, today, I'm happy to say that, you know, I've had uh, the ability to visit 23 of the 25 communities uh, with the remaining two hamlets scheduled early next month. While visiting these communities, I had the opportunity to meet with many constituents and hear their thoughts and concerns. The majority of the concerns were significant ones and were heard unanimously in every community. Issues like the Nutrition North program, the high cost of living, the suicide crisis, the lack of mental health services and facilities, the lack of housing, the lack of addictions treatment facilities, the high cost of transportation, having a quality education curriculum for our youth, the lack of youth activities and facilities, the loss of Inuit languages, connectivity and bandwidth, and of course, climate change and there are many more. My point is that the people of Nunavut are currently faced with many, many issues that are not just affecting one or two communities, but they're affecting all communities. I believe one potential way to help alleviate these issues is to reform, reform how we allocate funding to the Arctic region. Currently, the per capita system of allocation is failing Nunavut. I continue to stress this to colleagues that Nunavut is unique, that we have a small population spread out over 25, 25 completely isolated communities. I stress the fact that Nunavut requires a needs-based approach to funding allocation. And I've stated this in the House many times. I'll give you an example of how the per capita system fails the people of Nunavut. In Budget 2017, there was an announcement of funding for mental health and wellness in First Nations and Inuit communities. $118 million over five years was announced. But unfortunately, Nunavut sees a tiny fraction of this funding because of our small population. And to clarify, you know that the, the suicide rate in Nunavut is 10 times the national average and has been declared a territorial crisis. And yet, 
based on the per capita system, we received the smallest fraction, the smallest fraction of funds for mental health. And that's just one example of many where the system fails us. Changing the system from per capita allocation to a more needs-based approach, I believe, would be a good start, a good start in, in addressing some of our major issues. Nunavut and all of Canada's Arctic, for that matter, represents, I believe, tremendous, tremendous potential for Canada's economic and environmental future. I think that we can all agree that climate change is impacting the environmental stability of Canada's Arctic. It is important that current and future assessment of this impact is considered using both science-based evidence and traditional, Inuit, uh, traditional Indigenous knowledge. A warming climate presents potential beneficial and negative impacts on the Indigenous way of life. For example, global warming and subsequent ice reduction or reduction in ice will increase access through Arctic waterways, including our Northwest Passage. Increased waterway access will allow more import and export of resources to, from, and through the North. This will in turn strengthen the Northern Economic Foundation and provide the people with the resources they need. However, with increased shipping traffic, we increase the risk of oil and chemical spills that could devastate our waters and wildlife that we rely on for years to come. Another example, a warming climate in the north will enable increased on-land exploration and industrial activities. Melting ice may uncover potential hydrocarbon and mineral deposits. However, without adequate consultation and adherence to, a reg to regulatory processes, increased exploration and industry in new regions could potentially interrupt the habitat and migratory pathways of Arctic wildlife, drastically changing traditional Inuit harvesting areas. In fact, the warming effect of climate change has already impacted these traditional activities. Hunting, fishing, and gathering in Nunavut has, has changed have changed as traditional travel routes and campsites are, are now becoming unreachable. Foreign insect species are now appearing and could potentially spread disease to, other, to the wildlife. We're also seeing, uh, I think in Clyde River or Kikik Hardwack last year, there was someone caught an Atlantic salmon. <laughs> that's a first. Maybe that's where they all went. <laughs> um, I think this only furthers the need uh, for science-based approaches to learn how we can adapt to the fast-paced changes to our land. And lastly, while well, the effect of climate change is projected to boost tourism and promote infrastructure growth, existing infrastructure in Nunavut was designed and built for a permafrost foundation. Climate change will thaw the permafrost and is thawing the permafrost and cause, is causing buildings to shift, sink, and crack. This, of course, is a significant consideration for our current and future infrastructure developments. As you can see, there are several considerations with respect to climate change and the impact it will have on Inuit and our way of life. In the end, I think the most important thing, the most important thing is that the Inuit and the government of Nunavut are consulted, consulted when it comes to all future, all future considerations for the Arctic. Whether it be in reference to how funding is allocated or how we work towards dealing with issues such as climate change. Our voice not only needs to be heard, but the government must translate, must translate this knowledge into real action. I think many of the issues that we face uh, many of the issues that we face, are, they're not new ones. They've been around and impacting Nunavut for many, many years. 
as uh, Senator Watts said, reports have been written, shelved, and rewritten uh, again. And I think now, uh, you know, now is the time for change. And uh, with that, I'll close and look forward to any comments or questions you may have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for four excellent presentations that help to set the stage and deal with the different perspectives, different aspects of the government Inuit relations and the future needs of the people of, uh, of the Arctic region of, uh, of this country. So now we're going to go to uh, senators. Uh, I thought I saw Senator Dean come on out, join us at the table. There's room. And uh, uh, again, I would mention to the audience uh, that if anybody wants to uh, either make a comment or ask a question, that we, that Agnes, where's Agnes? Yeah, she's over there. Get, get your name uh, and any affiliation that you might want to uh, uh, relate it to, uh, to her, and we'll uh, work you in. So we've got three senators on the list so far, and oh, we got a lot more coming up. Well, Senator Bove to start. Well, thank you. And I would uh, really like to thank all of you for your presentations. The issues are huge, the area huge, the complexities uh, co very complex. And I would like to thank you uh, for the maps, um, the underlining of tradition, the underlining of the problems, the inherent rights, and the articulation of needs. Uh, with this exponential, with the exponential rates of change, which is affecting every aspect of life and work in the North, um, from traditional roots and lifestyles to health, uh, I appreciate your comment um, uh, regarding science-based approaches being needed. My concern may be very simplistic. It seems to me uh, aspects of many of these issues are embodied in some of the work of many of the existing committees of the Senate. Um, my concern is, as we take a look at the interconnectedness, how do you think, as senators and as Canadian government, we should be approaching the interconnected relationships of these um, multi-complex issues that are facing the people that are facing the future that are, are being put upon us by climate change and technological developments the stage is big and i guess i'm i'm looking for the best way to connect these issues to to, to come to uh, a sensible way of, of of discussing their impacts who wants to start uh, um, Tutu, do you want to start, or Charlie? Oh, okay, so my go light's ahead. on. I Your light's on, so you go ahead. <laughs> I could, I could give Other panelists can jump in let, afterwards, but we'll start. We, we can let the Senator walk. Oh, okay, okay. we'll let the we'll senior, respect our the senior man right? go here. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll try to respond to your, uh, your questioning uh, in regards to how do we, as a political instrument that do exist, available to us, <clears throat> how can you help? Well, first of all, and I think you're here, and you're listening to what we have to say, and uh, hopefully this would allow you to have a bit, a bit more understanding of uh, the problems that we're having in regards to dealing with this particular issue. But how do we advance and take it a step further on this whole matter? And if you are looking at the whole question of uh, lack of communication or lack of implementations on treaties that has been put forward, I, I would have to say that we should have an instrument, a permanent instrument in place within the system, rather than going to Supreme Court of Canada. And if we could have an exchange and dialogue with the present government, it could be my, maybe by department by department, sector by sector by sector, uh, I think there is a way to, uh, to establish that. The, the problem is that is the government of Canada in power are willing to establish what's missing today, that is closing the gap between our society and the bigger society. I think this, that's only the partial answers that I'm giving you uh, a possible a way of closing the gap. Uh, 
But then again, uh, what do you do? We do have a great deal of problems in regards to the implementations of modern treaties. So we just take it for granted that things will improve down the road? I don't think so. Because the 40 years have already passed in regards to James B. Norton Quebec Agreement, and the, the law of the government and the policy of the government still have not been aligned to correspond with the treaty that was put together. Keeping that in mind, um, we should, you know, I think since the Senate is going through the modernization, I think it's a perfect instrument to begin to, to, carry, to, begin to start carrying the responsibility, such as being res uh, uh, representative of the regions and also representative of the Aboriginal people and things of that nature. And I, I think we should move in that direction. Thank you. Anybody else in the panel? Hunter? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the question. I, I totally agree with uh, what Senator Watt has uh, said, but I think, you know, that's the one thing that the government, you know, the federal government now is looking at it. It's not just, you know, the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. Uh, it's a whole of government approach on it. And I think that, uh, you know, that's in a recognition finally that, um, you know, these issues are much bigger, much broader, and much more complex than the mandate of one department. It, it takes a whole of government approach to, to do it. And, you know, and I, you know, to me, that is the sensible thing to do. You have to look at it from the bigger picture and not just to try and funnel it off to, okay, well, this department or this committee is going to look after it. Um, because, you know, it's been going like that for over 150 years and uh, hasn't worked so far. So I think, uh, you know, I'm optimistic of that type of approach. And I think, you know, if something was uh, established within the Senate along the same lines to look at it, not just from this committee or this committee or this committee, but an overarching um, body um, to address and, and push forward those issues, to me, that would be the sensible thing to do. Thank you. Okay, may, may I just make uh, one? a quick supplementary. It's, it's not even a supplementary. It's a follow-up. Uh, thanking uh, Senator Watt for his call for uh, a, a special committee to take a look at these issues together. I think it's important work to do. Okay, thank you. A any comments from the other two panelists, uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Doro? No. Yes. Yes. Thank you for thank you for the opportunity, uh, and also thank you for the question and. Um, the fact that uh, in articulating the question, you highlighted the interconnected nature of the diverse array of issues facing uh, not only Arctic Indigenous peoples, but uh, all Indigenous peoples across Canada. And it, it, it's true, the issues are complex and they are diverse. As, uh, as Hunter uh, pointed out, the, the wide range of um, uh, shocking socioeconomic standards and uh, disparity between the North and the South. And I agree with his comment about the need for a whole of government approach. I also think that um, uh, human rights education, so that um, uh, average persons uh, across Canada uh, become more intimately familiar with the fact that uh, Inuit, as well as other Indigenous peoples in Canada, have distinct uh, human rights. And indeed, the UN Declaration is responsive to this array of issues that uh, Hunter listed um, that are shocking uh, uh, standards, especially in comparison uh, with the South. I think that um, one of the key issues is dialogue and uh, dialogue and discussion, a platform that allows for ongoing dialogue and discussion. The, the final thing that I want to share is that in the, in the early uh, 90s under uh, the Governor Tony Knowles administration here within the state of Alaska, uh, the state of Alaska as a political subdivision of the United States determined that they wanted to have
a nation to nation, or excuse me, government to government relationship between the state of Alaska and tribal governments uh, across the state. Uh, Alaska comprises close to 40% of the total number of federally recognized Indian tribes in the United States. So there are about 230 of them uh, out of the 540 or so across the US. And in the course of um, an ongoing dialogue, uh, the executive branch, the governor's office, uh, directed all of the various different departments in the state of Alaska individuals, people who work within the bureaucracy to engage in dialogue with tribal government representatives on their most urgent needs and to begin to bridge the gap that did exist in terms of this government to government relationship. It started with what was referred to as the Millennium Accord which was a year-long negotiation between tribal government representatives and the state administration. But essentially what the government was outlining, and I think it's akin to what uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, has, has, has promised and included in his mandate letters to the ministers, that uh, you should fully adopt and implement the UN Declaration. And like the Millennium Accord, there was an effort to integrate indigenous human rights, whether it was health and social services, uh, rural and uh, community development, uh, Department of Energy. In, in all spheres of uh, government, they were given the directive to engage in dialogue and try to close the gap, as has been mentioned here. And I just illustrate that as, as one uh, potential example in the commitment to implement the declaration, that there are, are ways to do so. Thank you. <clears throat> just before I go to Dr. Porta for an answer, I just want to welcome Senator Eaton, Senator Patterson from the Conservative Caucus who have joined us. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Dr. Porta, you wanted to Yeah, respond. I will be brief because I think they really cover part <coughs> of my, my answer, but I would like to thank you for the question. And I, I think the core of the problem is the lack of understanding, not in the Senate, but in general, of, uh, of Arctic, uh, of indigenous issues, indi indigenous issues in general, and Arctic issues in particular. So I think that asking the question of how you find the interconnection is the first step. And um, I don't know exactly how to answer that question, but I would imagine that one first step would be to, or second step would be to, to, to form some kind of, a, I don't know, study group that would actually understand what those connections are. It's obvious that there is a, a connection between um, uh, health, uh, the health crisis, suicide, um, housing, uh, and, um, and, and governance uh, of, of marine resources. But, um, but the way in which governments usually approach this issue are from, from different perspectives and, and from, um, through different uh, initiatives that are not interconnected. And that is creating a great deal of pressure in the indigenous peoples and particularly in the Arctic. Thank you very much. I'd like to join in with Senator Egerton to point out the arrival of Senators Eaton and Patterson. You have expertise in this area of business, uh, business in the Arctic, so you're most welcome here and thank you for coming. I'd now like to turn the floor over to Senator Mercier. Well, thank you, uh, Chair and uh, uh, no, colleagues. Uh, uh, this has been a very useful and, and interesting session. Uh, I, I had a question for uh, Mr. Tutu. In my trips uh, to the Arctic over the years, uh, obviously, uh, uh, it became, and I'm also a member of the Senate Standing Committee on Transportation and Communications, is where we were doing a study on airports. And uh, uh, the airports in the Arctic are, 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 are as important to survival as the 401 would be to the city of Toronto, uh, uh, to put it in, in proper context. But your discussion of, of, of the, the effects of climate change on infrastructure, could you, could you give specific examples of the, uh, 
of the problems with, his, with respect to airports, not just in, in the larger communities, but in the smaller communities. And, and isolation is becoming even more ser more pronounced because of, uh, of the effect of climate change on the condition of airports uh, and runways that, that are, are becoming uh, less usable and the change in the, uh, the, the size of, of aircraft that can be that can be used and in many cases that I understand that could be life-threatening. Perhaps you could give us an example or two. I could give you 24. <laughs> okay. Cal, what I say, we just got a new airport there uh, and some updates to the, to the runway, which is, is long overdue. Um, but I mean, I was in Kimroot this summer and, you know, their terminal is a trailer. Uh, a couple trailers put together. Uh, you know, there's fumes from the plane coming right into the terminal building. They have to air it out after the plane gets there all the time. Uh, you know, and I think, you know, a lot of the infrastructure, the airport infrastructure, like you say, that's our public transportation. That's our only means of transportation. And, um, you know, it's been neglected, as the Auditor General pointed out in his report uh, last spring. And, uh, you know, the the length, like you say, the length of runway in, you know, Repulse Bay or now yet, um, you know, if they had another 100 feet in length, they could, you know, double the capacity of cargo that they could bring in there. I mean, and you know, when I talk about the the high cost of living, the high cost of operating in the north, I mean, that infrastructure limits the type uh, and use of aircraft that could get in, and even even navigational aids. You know, you look at some communities like Pangertown and Kickatardrack, where if they're they're visual only. You know, and if you, you don't have the um, modern uh, navigational aids that could help aircraft get in under, you know, like right now, I think in Pang, it's like three miles visibility and like 2,600 feet or something like that. Uh, otherwise, you know, they miss. And, you know, those types of things, the, and the length of the runway, the gravel runways, those things limit the type of aircraft that can get in there and what they can carry. And those are generally older, inefficient aircraft, which again drives the cost of, of living up in the north. So I think you know an investment in that infrastructure one is crucial for, like you say, safety reasons, but it'll also uh, you know could help alleviate and, and bring down uh, the cost of living in the north. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? No. Okay. Uh, Let's go on to, uh, again, I get more names on the list, uh, and I do have one person in the audience I will be getting to. If there's anybody else, again, tell Agnes. Um, uh, Senator McFedrin. Thank you, Senator Eglich, and thank you to um, our parliamentarians and also our researchers for really excellent, helpful presentations. Just about 10 days ago, I stepped off a C-17 um, with eight delegates from 18 countries for a NATO Parliamentary Association trip. And um, I was surprised uh, to be the only Canadian parliamentarian on that trip. Um, my questions come out of some of what I experienced uh, in that time. First of all, to you, Senator Watt, if I could just ask, if there's something specific that we should be um, supporting uh, Inuit people and their representatives in, in relation to the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, is there, is there a gap there that somehow can get filled if we were to work on that? Um, and my question uh, to you, um, Honor, Honorable Tutu, is, the Canadian Forces, the Rangers, this is an open question to everyone. Um, here's my observation from those, those days uh, uh, in the Arctic. We didn't meet a single solitary Inuit person. Not a single legislator, not a single ranger, not a single municipal leader. Um, there are obviously some good reasons for that, I'm sure, from the Canadian Armed Forces perspective, but it, it was quite remarkable. And I'm just wondering if there's any commentary that you're comfortable sharing about 
the role, the presence of our Canadian Armed Forces um, in the North, suggestions that we should be looking at? Well, I guess uh, on your first questions, uh, I believe <coughs> it's related to the United Nations, uh, whether there is a need to look at that instrument to see what needs to be work done in terms of closing the cap, or is there a mechanism there that is satisfying us to be able to put through certain things that we need to put through from time to time? Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, uh, our representative uh, in the UN daily is more expert in that field, and I would ask her to respond to you on that, on that, on that issue. Okay. Dr. Did you hear the question okay? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Thank you very much uh, for the question. I uh, first of all want to point out in relation to uh, the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues speci specifically, um, there is a category of participation and that is uh, in regard to indigenous parliamentarians and the opportunity for indigenous parliamentarians and, and uh, parliamentarians generally to engage in the work of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, in particular at the annual sessions. In fact, uh, indigenous uh, parliamentarians uh, have a um, have a a much better seating arrangement than other participants uh, within the annual sessions of the permanent forum. So that um, category of, um, of indigenous representation is accommodated uh, within the permanent forum. Uh, my general comment about um, increased uh, participation would be uh, for um, members of uh, either the, the distinct and in individual departments to become more engaged in the work of the forum, including uh, the various different uh, thematic studies that the permanent forum uh, initiates from time to time based upon uh, their uh, recommendations which are crafted at the annual sessions. The second thing I would say is that the Government of Canada could assist Indigenous peoples in the ongoing dialogue centered on enhancing the participation of Indigenous political institutions, or for us uh, in North America, tribal governments and First Nations within the General Assembly. There has been a, um, a discussion that was initiated some time ago about how to uh, create a political and intellectual space for Indigenous peoples within the General Assembly uh, to uh, further influence um, the initiatives of the General Assembly, but moreover to uh, increase awareness of the UN member states about the issues facing Indigenous peoples as well as the content of their rights. So um, uh, yourselves and um, uh, the Government of Canada generally could uh, continue to uh, push that particular initiative uh, forward as a, a way to be more engaged in the UN and the way to and a way to um, do so in favor of Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Hunter Tutu. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Karen. Thank you for the question. I think I'm assuming if you're up there, you landed in Alert or Eureka, where there was Resolute. In, in Resolute Bay. Oh, well, and if you met someone from town, you probably met a ranger. No, we met no one. We were introduced to not a single Inuit person. That's disappointing, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I know there are many uh, in, in all the communities, there are many rangers up there, and, and we're very proud um, to participate in that program. Uh, they've expanded the junior ranger program, uh, you know, to me, and, and the rangers help out any, any of the exercises they do up north. The we were shown involved. slides. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we didn't uh, meet anyone. Yeah, well, I know whoever organized it, I think maybe yeah. it was a slight oversight. I say, but I, you know, I think you know the involvement of Inuit 
um, you know, whether it be a ranger or people from the community or municipal leaders or, or, or territorial MLAs, um, I think, you know, the input that they could provide uh, is first-hand input. And I think that's unfortunate that that opportunity was missed and something that should be considered in future visits. Thank you. Thanks. I agree. If I may suggest next time, speak to Mr. Tutu before going. I didn't organize it. <laughs> Senator Royal. Merci, Madame le Président. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Doro, for your presentation. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is in relation to the uh, uh, claim of sovereignty of Canada over the, uh, the water of the Northwest Passage. As you know, uh, we have a dispute with the American government and some other countries that th who claim that uh, this passage is international sea while Canada claim it is a national territory. Uh, do you think that with the now adoption of the UN declaration uh, for the indigenous people, that that could be helpful uh, in the solution of that dispute. Uh, because as you know, the declaration is pretty clear. Um, the Aboriginal people have to have a voice when their land and territory is uh, under claim. And as uh, Professor Aporta has clearly uh, explained, the Inuit people have occupied uh, the sea. Uh, it for time immemorial, so it, it is their territory in a way. Uh, how do you see the impact of the UN declaration in the progress of the arbitration? Because the, the arbitration is done under the convention of the law of the sea, uh, which is a UN uh, treaty. So you have two instruments coming from United Nations that is, in my opinion, have to be reconciled in the arbitration. So what, what is, in your opinion, the impact of the declaration for the solution of that dispute with our neighbor? Mm -hmm. Well, um, be mindful that you're asking an American. Um, of course. Uh, I, I, yeah, I want to but, test your objectivity. <laughs> <laughs> but I think first and foremost, I am Inuit. So uh, in that regard, I think that uh, this is actually a really helpful question and a helpful discussion uh, that could be undertaken. From, from my point of view, um, there is no question uh, about uh, the need for um, intersecting both of these two international treaties. And, and I think there's no question that in doing so, the results should be in favor of the indigenous peoples, the Inuit as a maritime, uh, as, as maritime peoples. As uh, Dr. Aporta has illustrated, the reliance upon the sea ice, the reliance upon the, uh, the, the coastal areas, uh, which uh, I, I should uh, provide the footnote that it is highly significant that the Labrador Inuit land claim agreement uh, includes in the context of territory includes the 12 mile territorial sea consistent with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. There is ample room to kind of look at this particular uh, and important element of that uh, land claim agreement. But specific uh, to your question, um, in my view, the interests and the rights of Inuit related to lands, territories, and resources uh, could be extremely helpful to the government of Canada in their view and their position about the internal waters of all of uh, the area in the Canadian high Arctic uh, islands, which is, as has been illustrated, Inuit homelands. May I have another? And I think Question. Go ahead. Yeah, may I have another question to you? I don't want to interrupt you, but the time is short. If there is a yeah. conflict between the interpretation, for instance, that the Inuit may give to, say, Section 32.2 of the UN Declaration that provide that uh, uh, Aboriginal people 
uh, have to give prior uh, consent for any project affecting their lands or territories, if there is a conflict between the way that, for instance, the Inuit people see the exploitation of their resources and territory, and the claim of the government, uh, I should say the position of the Minister of Justice of Canada, you might have known that last summer uh, she had uh, published 10 principles of interpretation in the approach that the Canadian government will follow in its relationship with the Aboriginal people, whereby the Canadian mm -hmm. government claimed that they have to consult and accommodate, but there is no right of prior consent, per se. If there is a, a problem of interpretation of obligation, who's going to be the, arbitra the arbitrator finally? And my question is, under the UN declaration, do you see a process through which, for instance, the Inuit could go at United Nations to seek some interpretation of the section of the UN declaration that might conflict with the way the Canadian government would, would interpret its obligation under the UN declaration? Absolutely. The, um, uh, the right to free, prior, and informed consent, uh, which is not only referenced in Article 32 of the Declaration, but in a range of other articles, has already been, uh, I'll use the term, arbitrated and addressed by human rights treaty bodies, as I mentioned in my presentation, by regional and uh, domestic commissions and courts. There's a wealth of information about how to operationalize the right to free prior and informed consent. And uh, I must say that uh, the, the previous government's characterization of the right to free prior and informed consent as a right to veto is a complete mischaracterization of the content of that right. The, the content of that right is largely based upon procedural elements and dialogue between the government of Canada and Indigenous peoples, including Inuit. So uh, for purposes of the understanding of it, the articulation of it, and uh, specifically the interpretation of the right to free, prior, and informed consent, either in relation to administrative and le legislative matters or uh, in relation to development activities that could adversely impact uh, the rights, the lands, territories, and resources of Indigenous peoples, including Inuit, um, can be uh, addressed through the procedural aspects of operationalizing the right to free, prior, and informed consent. Uh, I think there are, are numerous ways to address this particular issue and to not characterize it as uh, 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 indigestible um, fashion, I mean, to, to uh, ensure that uh, there is dialogue and that there is a way to achieve free, prior, and informed consent, and, and rather than resisting it and application in relation to the Arctic Ocean, coastal seas, or any other issue of concern uh, to the rights and interests of uh, and other Indigenous peoples in Canada. Thank you so much. Any other comments, panelists? Let me go to, uh, uh, if there are no other comments, uh, and I, that's a very vital question. Uh, let me go to the floor uh, and ask, uh, there's an, uh, one person I have uh, in terms of the audience participation, and then I'll come back to the table. Uh, Marika Morris is from the School of Canadian and Indigenous Affairs at uh, Carleton University, and you have up to three minutes for questions or comments. Kuyanami Nakuamik for your very rich and powerful presentations, all of the presenters. Um, there are so many issues that I would like to ask you about, but I'm going to uh, specifically try to delve a little bit further into something Senator Watt said, and that is um, about the Arctic Council and eight, eight member states and Inuit are not there. And this is so, uh, if Inuit were there as equal partners, 
in that and other forums, perhaps we would see some progress on some of the issues that Mr. Tutu raised. So I would like to delve further into what is your vision of Inuit chairing the Arctic Council and hosting the Arctic Council, which Inuit? Because Inuit are across four countries. Mr. Tutu raised the issue of permafrost. There's a nuclear reactor on permafrost in Russia that if that were to shift, that would greatly impact uh, Yupik in, uh, in Russia. So which Inuit would be represented at the table? Which Inuit would be hosting? Would it be the um, Inuit uh, Circumpolar Conference? Would it be um, ITK and representatives of Inuit of the different countries, Russia, Denmark, uh, US? Um, would it be regional organizations, uh, including you know, land claims organizations like NTI and Makivik? So how would you envision this? And I'm asking you because I completely support Inuit being equal partners, and I want to know what to advocate for. So please tell me. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for your, uh, for your question. Um, I, for one, were directly involved at the first design of Arctic Council, that goes many years back. Uh, by saying that, then, um, you know, I have followed, ever since I was no longer participant, and I have followed the, uh, the trend of the Arctic Council when there is a new subject matter that they have to deal with, and I try to follow it as closely as much as possible. My thought right from the beginning is that Inuit have to be the host. That was, I came to that conclusion a long, long time ago. But it never really followed up by any, any government representative, either, uh, neither a Canadian or, uh, or seven Arctic Councils uh, that are participating at the Arctic Council. Inuit definitely have to upgrade their involvement. Not only to be involved in those instruments, but they should at least to try to take the lead in terms of what should be happening in the Arctic, because they know best. And it's your homeland. By saying that, uh, the, the question that you have put forward is, it still have to be worked out by the Unit Circumpolar Conference, along with the ICC, I, ITK, ICC, with, whichever the name that, the, uh, that they use today, have to be definitely involved from the Inuit perspective. As you know, that some of our institutions that we have under us at our disposal, like ITK, for, uh, for an example, is incorporated on uh, the part two of the Act, which is a friendship type of organization. It's not political, it's not for profit. So if it's not for, if, if it's not for political, who do we have a political person to represent us? So I think this is an area that have to be straightened out between the countries that are involved on the uh, Inuit Circumpolar Conference. We have always anticipated from the day one, those are have to be looked at further, revisit, restructure it in certain ways if they need be. But when it comes down to the point of uh, the basis of those various organizations, they are considered really not the true representative of the Inuit. So this is a one area that needs to be straightened out. Let me take it a little bit further. What, what do you ask me what I envisage? Knowing the fact that uh, many different countries have an, an interest into the Arctic wanting to extract min raw minerals and whatnot, including the oil. By saying that, it's, it bothers me a great deal knowing the fact that we're not in the same level of those different countries that is going to be participating in the Arctic. So what are we looking for in order to balance, at least to try to do what we can to try to balance uh, whatever the system is going to be used to interlock, in, 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 uh, to uh, in exchange uncertain ideas and so on. 
maybe we should be talking about a need to examine statehood. For an example, only the statehood, the states are the ones that are going to be directly involved in the dialogue that is going to be taking place within the country. For therefore, we need to elevate our status. If they already could be understood, and even though it's a partnership with Canadian government, it should upgrade the status of a Canadian Arctic. I think that is an important. It's related to question of sovereignty. I hope I answered your questions on that. Thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, how about the other panelists? Anybody want to weigh in on this uh, question? Uh, Dr. Uh, Doro, perhaps? Yes. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question and the sentiment uh, with which it was uh, posed. I think that um, uh, the just a, a, a short uh, bit of history. When the rules of procedure were being uh, negotiated, uh, one of my uh, sticking points, though it wasn't uh, followed by uh, the Inuit leadership at the time, was to uh, ensure that the Inuit and other Arctic indigenous people, circumpolar wide, had a seat at the table, an effective seat at the table, including the right to vote. And so your question is, is um, kind of consistent with that view and the, and the idea of equal partners, um, especially in the face of additional observer governments uh, joining uh, the Arctic Council as observers who have much more uh, power to influence the work of the Arctic Council, there is a need for either e equal partners or increased and enhanced participation of organizations uh, like the Inuit Circumpolar Council as a permanent participant. I think that this, this issue does need to be uh, revisited, um, especially when um, the discussion or rhetoric actually about meaningful participation arises. Uh, because from my assessment um, as, a, as an outside observer to the activities of the Arctic Council, they, though people talk about meaningful engagement and the eight Arctic states talk about meaningful engagement, they've accommodated uh, the six indigenous non-governmental organizations in the status of the permanent participants. The real question is, what is the outcome of that meaningful engagement? Where is the evidence that uh, they were able to influence the outcomes, whether it is in uh, the senior Arctic official meetings, the three binding legal agreements that have emerged or been spawned by the Arctic Council, or in the detailed work of the six working groups of the Arctic Council? That's the real question. And from my point of view and my assessment, uh, there's not enough evidence there to make the argument that the permanent participants do have meaningful engagement. The final thing I'll say on that is that I, I believe that Senator Watt is right about um, attempting to have a single organization be responsive to the diverse needs of Inuit from the Russian Far East, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, and potentially uh, enhance participation in the Arctic Council by Arctic Indigenous peoples could uh, help to address that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duro. La parole maintenant à la sénatrice Dick. Um, thanks to all the presenters this morning. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Um, as some of you know, the um, Aboriginal Peoples Committee uh, traveled uh, into up north about two and a half years ago. And we were released a report in February 2016 on, on Inuit housing. So we actually got to see the lay of the land. We actually got to see the effects of climate change in some of the communities. And although I didn't get a chance to eat muktuk, I did eat sea urchin, which was really quite remarkable. Um, my question relates to the maps, but I think it's going to be a somewhat broader question. 
when we traveled up north, it, I think what really impresses me is that uh, how do you find the uh, landmarks, uh, especially when you're in places like a glue lick, where to, to a southerner, there, there's nothing but snow and ice. And so it's amazing to me that we have this amazing system of trails that cross the whole Arctic. Uh, and from what I could gather from your talk, uh, it seemed like uh, you were focusing on the purpose of those trails being mainly to do with hunting and fishing. But I'm wondering if the, the trails uh, were evidence also of trade trade between uh, different Inuit communities in different, let's say, the uh, western versus the eastern Arctic? Or were there, was there trade with the southern First Nations? Because the, uh, the southern communities have mapped extensive trade routes that extend all the way down to uh, um, Central and South America. So was there that kind of connection? And then carrying along with that kind of thought, uh, would, could these trails be used as evidence of uh, traditional Inuit governance, whereby they might get together to uh, talk about management of fishing, management of hunting, uh, sharing of food, uh, like maybe one region there's a food shortage and we have to have a meeting to discuss how to share that, sharing of medicine. So, you, likely the maps were used as evidence of sovereignty and how big a land claim belongs and how much of the sea belongs to the Inuit. But could it also be used as evidence of uh, sovereignty issues? Yeah. Thank you so much for the questions. Um, so regarding the first question, um, you're completely right. So it's not just about using the trails to connect to resources. It's, um, the, the trail system is really a social network and uh, in, in the deepest sense of the word. So uh, historically, um, ideas were uh, moved along the trails, um, uh, material culture, um, uh, encounters of many kinds took place, uh, marriages, uh, friendships were, um, uh, you know, related to this entanglement of, um, of itineraries. Uh, so definitely yes on that regard. And, and the second question is really important, I think, looking at um, this mobility system as a, a metaphor maybe of um, Inuit um, governance because when you look at, um, for instance, uh, a management problem or a management area, let's say fishing or mining, um, the, the trails bring in um, the interconnectedness of um, not only of people with resources, but also of people with people. So for instance, looking at the management of a particular species of fish or a particular marine mammal, uh, not in a comprehensive and integrated way, uh, what the trails might represent is um, uh, precisely the, the necessity of looking at, uh, let's say, marine spaces or spaces in general uh, as a, a part of uh, the ways in which people engage with the environment. Uh, the way that Inuit would find a way in Iglulik uh, that is so flat and not get lost, uh, remembering rocks that were of certain colors and having names for uh, creeks and so on, uh, reflects that deep connection with the environment uh, in a very systematic and specific way, but also in a very comprehensive way. Well, uh, we're down to the last 10 minutes. And I have three senators and one more person uh, from the audience. So that's four in 10 minutes. So we're going to really have to tighten it up to get this all in. Uh, let's uh, start with Senator Christmas. Clear, crisp questions, clear, crisp answers. And from those panelists that want to answer or directed at a specific panelist, Senator Christmas. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And again, my thanks to all four panelists. Uh, I'd like to direct my question to uh, Honorable Tutu. Um, I was quite struck by your statements um, about the distribution of mental health funding at the last budget. Um, and you described your efforts in um, per persuading um, others to look at it through a needs-based uh, needs approach. Can you elaborate, I have two questions, can you elaborate your efforts in 
trying to present the position of needs-based approach. And secondly, what can we do as parliamentarians uh, to try to change uh, from the per capita approach to a needs-based approach? Okay, well, thank you for the question. I mean, I just think making people aware of it, talking about it, and, uh, and recognizing it is, is the first step. And, you know, like any chance I get when I'm talking, whether it be infrastructure dollars or any type of dollar, you know, when you get a dollar down here, I always say it's like 33 cents up there. And that's a jurisdiction that you have the highest cost of transportation of materials and goods up there, the highest cost of construction, the highest cost of everything. So your dollar goes a heck of a lot less far than it does down here. Um, you know, the other example I always point out is, you know, like, you know, with people that say, Senator Watts it, like, we pay our taxes. You know, and I've always been of the view that, uh, you know, as Northerners, I think we pay more than our fair share of taxes. You know, you buy a TV down here for $500, you pay GST on $500. We buy the same TV up north for 2500 bucks. We're paying GST on that 2500 bucks. Um, but it, it's things like that, and then you look at, you know, for the population of the territory of Nunavut, like down south here, you generally probably have like one hospital. Well, up there, mm -hmm. we have 25 communities. We have to have 25 health centers. We have to have 25 schools, and in some communities more than like an elementary school, middle school, and high school. You know, all these things are factors that that people don't understand, and it's just making people aware of it, and that those are additional costs that. You know, because of the remoteness and the isolation, uh, we can't get away from. And those things cost money, and that has to be recognized. Thanks. Let me take one person from the, the one more person we have from the audience, Dr. Natalie Carter, Environment, Society, and Policy Group, the University of Ottawa. Thanks to all of the panelists. I'm left feeling with the I'm left with the feeling of wondering what can I do, what more can be done. And so my question is, how can researchers and academia best contribute to the government of Canada's meaningfully engaging with Inuit and taking action on these important matters that were raised today? Okay, who wants to tackle that, uh, Dr. I Porter, and then maybe Dr. Doro? Um, my. Uh, uh, the first thought is that there is a huge need of uh, creative, of finding creative solutions to the, uh, the problems that are uh, faced in the Arctic and indigenous people. So the need of thinking outside the box, of thinking outside of disciplines, um, of um, uh, linking uh, expertise from, uh, from uh, you know, the legal side and anthropological side and engineering and architecture and, and so on. Uh, to come up with, um, again, new approaches. The problems are, are old, uh, and the solutions that have been pursued are also old. Um, there is very little new creative thinking, and um, uh, thinking about you know, potential think tanks that might develop certain ideas um, that are different. Uh, might be a way of, of engaging. And the other issue is the, the need, I think, for um, reflecting on what participation means. Uh, because collaboration and participation, they're common words that are used all the time, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, et cetera. But what does it really mean to engage uh, indigenous communities uh, effectively uh, moving forward? Dr. Duro, did you have a comment? Yeah, thank you for the questions. I think that um, uh, especially within the academy, um, more uh, research and academic writing about these uh, particular issues. For example, the last question that was posed on um, uh, on a per capita uh, versus a needs-based approach as far as budgeting. I mean, a, a study on um, you know. A, a new formula uh, for allocation of funds that you know economists and others uh, within the academy could make such a contribution. I think the area of co-production of knowledge would be extremely useful between uh, academics engaged in research, um, working with uh, 
indigenous peoples and uh, utilizing indigenous knowledge in the co-production of knowledge within the academy, uh, which would validate the contributions that indigenous peoples have with their uh, wealth of indigenous knowledge. Uh, the third thing I would suggest is creation of intellectual space for expression by Inuit, for example, uh, for your, your various different respective academies to host roundtable discussions, to host uh, speakers to uh, generate uh, greater awareness about the broad array of issues that have been discussed even in the last couple of hours here. Thank you. Okay, to finish up, uh, and since we've only got five minutes, if uh, Senator Dupuis and, and uh, uh, Senator Cordy could both ask their questions, uh, and then we'll come to the panel for their response, please. So my question is, uh, and thank you all of the four panelists this morning for this very instructive uh, discussion. My question, I have a lot of questions for Senator Watt, but I have other forums to address that with him, uh, especially regarding an independent agent of parliament that would report annually to parliament on elimination of the gap and so on. But my more specific uh, technical question would be for Dr. Aporta. Uh, is there any narrative that was collected and documented to complement these maps? I like very much maps, and these are very useful, but I think that, so my question to you is, is there any narrative that would indeed express the sovereignty of Inuit over their occupation of land, intergovernmental relation between Inuit governments in various areas, regions of the country? because these traditions and customs and practices are already in, enshrined in Canadian law. And Senator Cordy, your question, then we'll get the answers. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of the participants this morning. This has been an excellent panel. Uh, Senator Watt has been talking to us in our caucus for years about climate change in the North and how it's changing the populations, um, the people and wildlife within the North. And we talked this morning about uh, airport runways, which may become um, difficult to use, buildings that are moving, rising water levels. Um, and, we've, and we know that the trails that you spoke about earlier across bodies of water in the wintertime may be not available or if available for shorter periods of time. So I'd like to talk, uh, perhaps um, uh, Mr. Tutu, you just visited most of your communities within the North, about climate change from a social perspective because the opening of the waterways could create more tourism, which could be a positive thing or, or not a positive thing. So I wonder if you could talk about it, how it's affecting the people in the North and is there any engagement or should there be an, a mechanism for engagement for the Inuit peoples of the North to talk about how to make po uh, climate change as positive as it can be for people in the North because of all the people in Canada, their life will likely be changed most dramatically. Alors, dans ce premier temps, Dr. Aporta, pour la question de la sénatrice du Thank you for your question. I, um, I think narratives are um, essential in understanding what the maps mean. Uh, because the, the lines are, are meaningless without an appreciation of what uh, what they represent. And, um, uh, you know, I have documented uh, Inuit narratives that are connected to uh, the trails, and this is an ongoing uh, idea, but um, uh, looking maybe into the future, um, uh, the idea that um, Daly uh, brought up in terms of uh, co-production of knowledge, this would be an excellent, um, um, I think, um, opportunity to uh, engage in a dialogue of what these um, uh, narratives are. Um, yeah. Thank you. Monsieur Honorable Tutu, for the question of Senatrice Cordy. Uh, Merci. Thank you for the question. I mean, I think absolutely, you know, Inuit should be involved and consulted and, and, and asked. And you, know, you talked about looking at some type of research that could be done. Um, you know, there's another there's another example. Um, you know, it's affecting, you know, people were telling me, you know, usually this time of year we're out on a snowmobile or out on the ice already. And that's it's not there now. You know, I was up in, in Resolute Bay. I said last year the bay there, it didn't even freeze over. And, you know, those are important, you know, like the ice there is, it's also like our highways, it's, it's land like ice. You know, that's, 
that's our highways to get around not only for to hunting areas but intercommunity travel um, you know we talked about the on, on government I mean there are, you talk about Inuit place names you know they call there are there are places that are named where, where people from different settlements or outpost camps would come and gather to, to you know you know so there there is that aspect of being able to get to different areas uh, that you could get to and now in some cases you can't and you know that does have an impact on on people like you know people really look forward to you know the different times of year because each you know each, each season is is a different opportunity for for harvesting or or visiting or stuff like that but and if that's you know and that is that is being impacted and you know that will have mm -hmm. an overall like a, an impact on on Inuit over over time and it is happening already um, and I think I just want to just throw something in on, on research uh, ideas you know I mentioned um, you know I always say said that the investment in the north is really you're investing in the entire Canadian economy um, mm -hmm. you know for any type of infrastructure anything that we have to build up there we have to purchase from the south and you know one of the things that you know might be look as uh, you know for every dollar that's invested in in the north you know how much of that actually flows back into the southern economy so you get away from that well if they get it they get so much how come we don't get it you know actually you do and you know i think that that's always something that that needs to be taken into consideration it would be good to have some some hard numbers on on stuff like that as well thank you okay we've uh, come to the end of our time uh I'd, I'd love to keep it going. You, very quickly, Senator Patterson. Yes, uh, thank you, and apologies for having been late. I just wanted to commend Senator Watt for his initiative in uh, being a big part of organizing this forum. And I want to mention that Senator Watt has introduced a motion into the Senate to set up a special committee on the Arctic, which could further study these important issues and make recommendations to government. And uh, I'm supportive and hoping to participate and hoping we can proceed with that uh, motion very soon. Thank you. Well, thank you. That, play, that plays into my closing comment, which was to say, okay, what are we going to do for follow-up? <laughs> and <laughs> and, that, and there, there's, there, and there's an answer on the table. Anyway, uh, that's one of the things that we need to do from uh, our open caucus and like to do is how do we follow up on these different issues? We've learned a lot today. We've had four excellent uh, panelists, and I thank you all very much, uh, Dr. Doro, Dr. Laporta, Dr. Tutu, and, and our colleague Charlie Watt for your, your input into this. And, and uh, yes, let's go forward and see how we can, we can bridge these gaps here and, and make life better for, uh, for the Inuit who live uh, in the Arctic area and deal with all those issues that have been mentioned uh, today. And uh, I've enjoyed being with my colleague for the first time, uh, Senator Raymond uh, Saint-Germain, and she will say a few closing words as well. There'll be a second time because I've enjoyed it very much as well. Je pense que ce matin, nous avons... This morning, we've seen that a lot has been done, uh, but a very little has actually been implemented. and. I find the motion of, of Senator Watt is wonderful. The Senate is going to be able to do something about this. The whole issue is the issue of the Inuit, the Canadian people, and it's an international, global issue. And we won't be able to achieve success in the Arctic if we don't respect human rights and have the support of the Inuit people so that the quality of life there becomes decent and meets current standards. And if there's not a solid partnership with, between the Canadian people and the Inuit, there, we will not be successful. So thank you, and until we meet again. October 18th, and it's all about NAFTA. Meeting is adjourned.